Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension. And we are here today to talk about how to get your garden started. This is our, uh, any, our in, how to get your garden started. We've got Susan Miller Hoover with us from the Payson Community Garden. And this is what we're talking about. So a little bit about the Gardening Country Extension webinars. Uh, I do these weekly uh, at Thursdays at 11. It'll be 60 minutes or less. We have a question and answer period while we, go, while we do this. I will go ahead and close down the video at uh, the top of the hour, but we'll continue to answer your questions until Susan's ready to go. So we're good here. Now, one thing I'm excited about here is I'm hosting the spring gardening classes for the Payson Community Garden in Northern Gila County, Arizona. So Susan is with the Payson Community Garden. She'll be our presenter today. Uh, and you can find this recording. It'll be at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. And I'll go ahead and share that information so, so you can find it. And the University of Arizona is an Equal Opportunity Affirmative Action Institution. Here's our agenda for today. Um, thank you for everybody who joined us early. Um, I'm Chris Jones, your moderator. Our presenter is Susan Miller Hoover, who will be speaking about getting your garden started. She'll have about a half hour presentation of slides. And at about 11.35, we'll switch to a question and answer discussion. I'll help moderate that. Just go ahead and put your questions into the chat box or Q&A, and we'll get those answered. And we'll finish up here at noon. Here is our speaker, Susan Miller Hoover from the Payson Community Garden. And with that, Susan, you are up and ready to go. So I'm gonna turn off my slides yeah. and you are up. You're okay. Good morning. I'm so excited to um, share our classes with Chris and all of you. Um, this is our second class for the 21 season, and it's all about getting started. So last week you learned how to wake up your garden, and now it's what you need to do to get your gardens ready for the planting season. And first and foremost, um, we want you to make friends. There's the staff and other gardeners that are in the garden are a wealth of information. Some of them have been there since the garden started in 2012 and know a lot about where we were and where we came from. Um, take time to look around the garden. Last year, because of COVID, people pretty much stuck to their own little gardens and didn't really walk around and see what's been done and who's doing it in which way. So there's a lot of information out there. Um, if you just walk around as the gardeners are planting their gardens and getting ready to build their water systems. And the last thing is you've got to have a plan. Um, unlike me, I always have a plan, but I never stick to it because I end up going out to the nursery and Glenn will have something there. And it'll be like, I have to have that in my garden. And I buy it and I take it out there and I plant it. And before you know it, I have more stuff in my garden than what I intended to. One of the most important things to think about when you're planning is how much time can you spend at the garden? What type of bed do you want? Do you want it raised or do you want it ground level? What plants do you want to plant? When to plant? Um, you're going to have to build a water system. And you also have to decide whether or not you're going to plant for a single or multiple seasons. We have some people that don't plant until June 
for a summer garden. So from March until June, their, their beds stay um, vacant. We have people that um, start planting. In fact, we had people out at the garden yesterday planting um, onions. So people are starting to plant some of the cool season plants again. And then as those mature and are harvested, then they start putting in their summer crops. And again, in August, um, they start putting in um, winter crops. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. So you do have to decide um, how many seasons you're going to plant for. One of the most important things to consider when planning your garden is how much time you have to spend at it. Your garden at home is easy to walk out your back door and look at your garden and see if it needs watering or weeding, but at the community garden, you have to plan for the time that it takes to get there. If you're planting seeds directly in the ground or whether you've got seedlings, you need to be able to come to the garden on almost a daily basis in order to um, take care of your plants and make sure that they're growing correctly. Um, seedlings require daily attention. Larger plants need less attention. And then there's things like bug control and weeding and pruning, harvesting, replanting for the next season, and on it goes. So make sure you have enough time to get to your garden and take care of it. The next thing to think about is, do you want a raised garden or a flat garden? We have both in the community garden and over the years more and more have come to have us build um, raised boxes for them. And the pros of having a raised garden space is that it makes the most of your soil, it improves drainage, it prevents soil compaction, and prevents soil erosion, and soil temperatures get warmer earlier. And that's important because you don't want to plant your seeds or your seedlings in soil that's too cold for them to grow in. The cons about building the box are the expense in getting the supplies and filling that box with amended soil. Depending on how tall your box is, um, will guide you in how much soil to put into your raised garden. So it's important that you make your choice before you start amending your soil because you don't wanna move that soil twice. We need to dig around the garden in order to make space for the wooden box. And so it's much easier to have flat soil to deal, deal with than it is to have um, a lot of amended soil there. So think before you start moving soil. Another important thing when you're choosing amendments is to look for this emblem. OMRI represents um, organic materials. And so you can be happy knowing that you're, you do have organic soil amendments and not something that just says it is. So if you don't see this emblem, ask the staff. We'll be happy to help you figure out whether it's truly um, organic or not. And last week, Glenn recommended to soil test. And what's up on the screen right now to your left are my jars of soil from last year. And you can see, um, if you look real close, that there is a demarcation between um, the soils on the, in the bottle on the left. You can't really see it that clearly with the right-sided 
bottle, but I did end up adding more organic material and composted manures to my garden to soften it up a little bit. The other thing Glenn suggested was testing for your nutrients, um, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus and pH. And this is a little test kit, one of them that you can use. So it's important uh, to do these tests before you start planting your garden so that you know what you need to add. When you look at the back of the garden, these are where we keep all of our different soils and they all have names. And at one time that was where the soils came from. But now most of this is different ages of composted manure. And we have a bunch out side the garden that one of the friends of the garden has a front loader and he comes in and tries to keep these um, piles full and you can take as much of this as you want and put it in your garden. Um, we have screens so that you can screen out the big rocks and things or whatever might be in there. And um, the one thing that I learned the hard way of is you don't have to fill your wheelbarrows all the way full because it's really, really heavy. And my garden happens to be in the very front of the um, garden. So for me to move this soil with a full wheelbarrow was um, hard to maneuver and hard to get to my space. So fill your wagons, fill your um, wheelbarrows um, conservatively and make a few more steps. We also have a big pile of dirt in the back that um, we have our garden um, refuge that we put in that we will be turning this year and um, that putting more manure and stuff on that. So that will also be available um, to you. So there's no right way to put amendments, um, which amendments in your garden do what works for you. Most of us change it up every year. And it also in the back of the garden, and this is an old picture, we have since cleaned it up so it doesn't look quite as um, messy. But back in the store, you will find things that gardeners have decided that they don't need. Um, and they're free for you to take and use. There's um, PVC pipe back there. There's plenty of tomato cages. Um, there's not a lot of wood back there because we took a lot of that and have been using it. But this store is for the gardeners. If you have something that you're no longer using, go ahead and put it back in the store for somebody else to use, but this is a good place to find things so that you don't have to um, spend a lot of money because setting up your garden is not inexpensive. So take advantage of what's in the store. The other thing that will save you some money is that we have um, tools, and wagons available. All the shovels and ricks and things are located at the front of the garden, on the fence, and in the back. And we have wagons and wheelbarrows in the back also, so you don't have to go all the way up and back to get them. We also have um, hand tools at the shack that you can borrow but you are more than welcome to use your own tools. Um, a lot of people do, you can keep them clean and sharp um, and always have them, have them with you, but they are here um, for you to use. A lot of people like to till their gardens and we do have that service um, available. Leo has a, 
team of tillers that will begin tilling usually in April, giving people enough time to amend their gardens and um, get them cleaned up. Just make sure that your garden has no tools, rocks, fencing, wires, string, or any other apparatus, because um, then he won't be able to get his um, tiller into your plot and clean it up. And if you have plants in there, but you want him to till around them, you need to be very clear in your markings for him. Um, and make sure all your amendments are in place and raked out. This is, um, we have some people that do no tilling, which is great, but we also have this service. So there will be a sign up sheet at the shack um, for you to um, put your dates down or your, when you're ready and then he will do them. They can do quite a few gardens at a time depending on how many um, people want to get them done. And as we go through the rest of this um, presentation, there's going to be a lot of handouts that I show you. And Plant Fair Nursery has um, them up on their website. You just have to go to plantfairnursery.com. And in the taskbar, click on about and how to find what you want and print them out. They're all free. Um, they have when to plant um, vegetables, companion planting, natural bug and disease control, um, and Glenn's magic elixir all on there so that you don't have to look around to find them. You can just print them out. The other thing that some people use um, is a sheet like this um, to plant their, their gardens. Some of the folks I know have marked the, their raised gardens with foot marks and they put a grid in um, twine across it so that they know what their spacing is. And I don't do that, I try, but again, I'm not a, a planner and my garden comes out okay, but it's never not as, it's never as pretty as some of the ones that have been planned out and are spaced correctly and that kind of thing. Um, last year, I wasn't thinking and I planted my onions going across the garden instead of going along the long side. And my watering system is along the long side. So of course, um, I had a lot more hand watering to do for my onions than if I had thought about where I placed them. So each year I get a little better. And so we will, um, we'll see how I do this year, but there's people that use spreadsheets to help decide when and where to plant. Um, so again, check with the nursery, um, check with other gardeners, see what they do. Uh, one thing that you want to keep in mind that a well-planned garden has less bugs, less weeds, and your produce is more easily accessible. So um, if you don't have a great planned garden. You may have overshadowing plants. The first year I planted everything in sight and the things that grew big and tall grew big and tall and the stuff that was underneath them didn't grow at all. So I learned a real valuable lesson about spacing plants and not putting too many in one place. Here's a couple of the handouts that I was talking about. Um, 
when to plant your vegetables. When you look at this handout, it tells you what your soil pH needs to be. It tells you what your soil temp needs to be for the seeds to germinate. And it also gives you a range of days in which to plant these um, vegetables. And the second page of this particular handout talks about the heirloom um, vegetables and which ones work well. The companion planting um, handout has um, a list of which plants to and flowers to put in um, your garden to help repel bugs. This one happens to be showing radishes and squash interplanted to help get rid of the squash bugs. Another one is basil with tomatoes helps um, not having the um, tomato worm because they don't like the smell of the basil. Nasturtiums, uh, marigolds, there's a lot of plants that are really good for helping keep the bugs away and helping the pollinators come in. So this handout is a very useful one that um, you can, can get from Plant Fair Nursery and I would recommend getting it. Um, one of the weird ones that I found is I usually fight with the Colorado potato bug and I read recently where if I was to plant um, horseradish, the same place I plant my potatoes, um, I would have less um, Colorado potato bugs. But the problem with that in a community garden is um, horseradish is really invasive and it would take over my garden and I wouldn't have anything else. And it's real hard to get rid of um, horseradish roots once you get them in a in a garden. So I don't think I'll be doing that, although I would like to. So what should you plant? Um, we ask that every garden give 20% of their product to the food banks. And we currently support three um, food banks, two in um, Payson and one in Pine. And last year we gave over um, 6,000 pounds or six tons of fresh produce. So think about when you're planting, maybe some of the things that um, would work in the food bank situation. Most of the food bank people, if they don't know what it is, they won't use it. So we try to get potatoes and sweet potatoes and lettuces and beets and different things like that, that people really know um, that they can, can use. Um, the other thing is, is what do you like to eat? Um, plant that, you know, sometimes it works well. Um, you know, in some gardens, some things, some veggies don't, but you won't know until you try. And a lot of us like to just experiment by putting different things in the ground um, each year to see if it will work. And our sweet potatoes was one of our experiments. And now we um, plant a lot of those. The other thing to consider is do you do canning? Do you freeze? Do you dehydrate? And how much you need um, for that? And with COVID last year, a lot of us couldn't can as much as we would like to because we couldn't find the jars and the rings and the seals. So a lot of us went to freezing and dehydrating. But um, 
if you want information on that, sometimes we have pop-up classes on how to dehydrate and can and those, those things. Um, we'll see how it goes this year um, if we're going to, but there are a lot of gardeners out there that do that. The other thing is we have a handout of the list of varieties of vegetables that grow well in the Payson area. And uh, one thing to think about is heirloom plants don't do real well in a community garden because um, there's too much chance for disease and they have not been bred to combat diseases and bugs. So think about that before you bring um, an heirloom um, seed into the garden. And um, when you're buying um, seeds, make sure you look for information about disease resistance and um, same thing with um, transplants. You want to get the hardiest plant that you can that um, will give you what you want to eat. And what about water? Our garden supplies three watering systems and um, they each do a little bit different. There is a maroon farm faucet. I believe there's three of them that during the month of March and into April before um, the worry about a freeze um, is still going on, you can get water out of those to hand water your garden because they don't freeze. The second um, watering system is our hand watering system, and it's the purple faucets that you will find um, throughout the garden. And you can hook up your hose or get a water can and water your garden with that. And that will come on next after the um, watering, the farm watering system. The last watering system to go on is our yellow faucets that this is where you will put your watering system in and we water the garden on a set schedule. Um, I don't know what the schedule will be this year. We're talking about changing it, but last year we watered three times a week and then in the hottest part of the summer, we added an extra watering just to make sure that the garden was there. So that's automatic. And then the water class that's coming up on March 4th will help you know what kind of equipment to get to make your watering system. Um, they have all kinds of good tips on what works for us and what doesn't work and what we don't allow in the garden. And so if you're going to buy your watering system early, just remember, don't buy anything that sprays um, water. We're looking at drip systems and those kinds of things so that we are not um, overusing water and wasting it. Uh, there are a variety of ways to set up your garden and these pictures depict a few. Um, our gardens are six feet by 25 feet and some of them are divided into three garden sections. Some are into four, like the one Glenn showed you last week. He has four sections in his so that he can water plants that require different um, water requirements. You'll also see different coverings um, and different ways of holding up those coverings. And we're going to have a class um, 
on coverings so you know when to use what kind and what they do for your your garden. You know it's tomato time in our garden when the colorful tool comes out and people have um, their tomatoes covered in tool and we have reds and blues and magentas and every color that you can imagine to keep the hornworm off of our tomatoes. So you can set up your garden any way that you would like. And again, the staff is there to help you um, in anything you need. So what's your plan? Are you gonna have a spring garden? Are you gonna have a summer garden or a winter garden or all three? The things to consider is the spring garden because we open um, the first Saturday in March, you need cold hardy plants the beets, the chives, garlics, carrots, cauliflower, onions, um, the coal plants, whatever you want to plant that will withstand um, the colder temperatures. And the other things to know is that you'll be pulling these out in May. And you want to pull your cold hardy plants early um, before they get sick or as soon as they have finished um, producing because they harbor things like aphids and whatnot. So thinking about when to pull them out of the ground instead of thinking, oh, I'll just leave them another week. Um, maybe I'll get some more. Well, you might, but you also might end up with a plethora of bugs that you don't want. The summer garden is for your tomatoes and beans, all kinds of different things um, that like the warm season. In Payson, our last frost is Mother's Day ish and I say that because the last two seasons we have had a freeze after Mother's Day and um, people have lost veggies because they did not expect it to freeze so just keep that in mind. Our frost free growing period is 160 days so you have plenty of time to get things um, growing. Some things to consider is that um, you may need a sunscreen because we have no shade in the garden, as you can see from the picture on this slide. And you don't want your veggies to burn. And um, the other thing to think about with your summer garden is vertical gardening. Um, putting in trellises so that your beans can grow up instead of across. You can get um, more produce that way and you aren't breaking your plants as you walk around. So consider vertical um, gardening. But with that being said, remember that this garden gets a lot of wind. And you need to make sure that your upright supports are very well um, supported. I've seen some of our good gardeners lose tomato plants because a wind came along and broke them off because the, what they thought were strong supports didn't um, support it in the wind. So just also keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind for summer gardens is the tomato cages that you buy in the big box stores or at the hardware stores don't work really well in the community garden for tomatoes. They work great for um, peppers and things like that, but they're just not strong enough to support your um, tomatoes. So again, use your neighbors and the staff to find out what works and what doesn't work. 
And then starting in August, you should start thinking about planting your cold hardy crops again, um, planting them underneath some of your summer crops so that they get shade and they get the coolness that they need to germinate. Our first frost is October 20th-ish. And um, we close the garden the third week in December. So usually you can harvest until the first week of December or so, but also take into consideration that's the time that you're trying to prepare your garden for the next season. Another thing to think about is succession planning. And that is extending the season that you're planting for. So for instance, if you really like beets, you would put in a row of beets and then one to two weeks later, you'd put in another and a couple weeks after that, you'd put in another row. And that way the growing season for beets has been extended and you can get more beets instead of having four rows of beets that you have to um, deal with at one time, you have some time to um, process each row of beets. Um, you can also plant another crop. Perhaps you've got a bunch of lettuce and um, you're taking that out and you're putting spinach in its place but you're staggering those times so that you can get more produce out of your garden than just a one-time planting. And we talked about three season planting, which takes advantage of the March through December um, growing season. It takes a little more planning to make sure that you're getting the used up veggies out and getting the new ones in in a timely manner so that you have enough of the growing season. Um, knowing when to pick your garden at their peak harvesting um, time so that you get your be best vegetables. So the getting into your planting strategies, one of the things that you need to um, think about is reading the back of your package and their spacing recommendations. For instance, they tell you um, for tomatoes that you need to space them three feet apart. Well, if you're going to plant 10 tomato plants, doing that spacing may not fit within your garden space. So think about reducing the spacing guidelines. And I think that next week, um, Chris is talking about intensive planning and things like that. Um, there's square foot planning guides that you can use. Um, and the other thing is to know which garden, which vegetables do better planted directly into the gardens, which ones do better um, from seeds. Uh, for instance, I tried planting um, beets from seedlings and I got some really bizarre looking beets because the roots didn't stay nice and straight. The same thing with carrots. Both of those do much better when you plant them directly in the ground, um, as does squash and things like that. Tomatoes do really well if you plant them as seedlings. So again, um, knowing what types of plants are better suited for how you want to plant them. 
some of the recommendations that we give um, for planting things other than vegetables in your garden are to plant pollinator attract flowers. We've got a lot of bee houses in the garden and we want those bees to come to your garden and pollinate your flowers. So we use marigolds, we use nasturtiums, um, we use a lot of different herbs in the garden. And one thing that you notice between the marigolds and herbs is that um, the bugs don't like their smell. So um, the more you put in and around, um, the better um, you, you have at getting rid of the bugs that are bad and getting the bees to um, work on your on your plants. There are um, some plants that we have learned not to put in our garden and most of these are invasive plants. I can't tell you how much mint we have dug out of the aisles of our garden because mint sure smells good and it looks good, but it is a very, very um, invasive. So if you want to use the mint to discourage bugs and that, we suggest you put it in a, um, in a pot. But even then, you have to be aware that if your mint starts to get root bound and the roots start coming out of the pot, that um, those roots will find their way into the garden. And next year, you will have um, mint plants growing where you least expect them. Morning glories are not allowed in Arizona, um, and, but we have had some people think about using them. We also have, um, uh, I just lost the name of the plant that is growing all over that we have to pull out, but things like Bermuda grass will be in the garden that you will have to take care of uh, and pull out of your garden. So be really, um, aware of of what's there if you have weeds get out of your garden as quickly as you can but remember not to put invasive plants in in your garden the other thing is artichokes take a lot of water so um, looking at plants that are water hogs you might want to think again about planting them in this garden. You may want to use them, do them at home. But um, just keep in mind that certain plants we would recommend that you don't have in the garden. And if you have any questions, again, just ask the staff. So make new friends, ask questions share your knowledge and have fun. And for those of you that don't know where I am in the garden, I'm in the first row on the east side, garden R1, S1, and nine times out of 10, I have a bright green hat on that has lots of vegetables and ants planted on it. So come see me in the garden and, um, I'm glad to share whatever I have and know with you guys. There's always at least one or two staff members in the garden to help with questions, usually more than that. Um, and if you see a garden that's doing really well, make friends with that gardener and learn what they do and what their techniques are. Questions? Um, very good. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, I had a little scare when I lost my electricity. Fortunately, 
I had shared the screen with you, so it was running from your computer and nobody missed it. However, I'm going to have to oh, figure good. out what to do about the recording because there are two recordings now and we have to figure out how to splice them and about the piece in the middle, but oh well, we, <laughs> if it's not one thing, it's always another, right? <laughs> it is. So yeah. I'm going to stop share and go back to you. So, there you are. Good. And, and I've got some questions already. First, I'm going to oh send out the link for the uh, evaluation. So if people would please click on that forms Google thing. It's a very short evaluation, takes about a minute or two. And just let us know if you learned anything, you're gonna share anything, other things we can talk about, very useful. And I also have Teresa asking, where can we find the recordings? And so I'm going to put the link to the Garden and Country Extension playlist in here. And if people will take that and um, bookmark it, you can find all the webinars, including the all the garden extension ones. So that's go ahead. Um, Chris, also on YouTube is the Payton Community Garden YouTube um, link that we can um, that you can find where these will be on and also our Facebook. So there's at least three places and I believe at, at some point they'll be put up on our um, website. So there's plenty of um, plenties of places to to find it. If you don't find it one place, look another. Very good. And here I'm going to go ahead and put in the Pacing Community Gardens website as well. Um, so Thank you. before I jump into these questions, we may have had people with us today that are not already members of the Pacing Community Garden or wish that they could be, and they'll just drive up for uh, all the time just to be able to do this. So tell us a little bit about being a member and getting a plot, and we'll, then we'll jump into the questions. Okay. Um, we have, I believe, 160 eight gardens in our um, community garden and they the big ones the 25 by six um, gardens rent for seventy dollars and we have some four by four gardens that rent for i believe 35 um, that are handicap and wheelchair accessible and then we have several i Think they're supposed to be three by six we just built um six more this season um that people can get to so basically you can go online when the website is up and get the um the agreement the garden agreement and send it in to the address on the bottom which is Linda Croy and she will assign our gardens. I think we have like 20 gardens available right still right now for people to come in. You can come in and take a look. We'll show you the gardens. And um, so that $70 that you pay pays for all your water. And um, so it helps you know, give you a good start. So it's really easy to get a garden or come in and just talk to one of the staff members. We'll see that you get a garden. Great, great. Okay, so Cheryl just wants to confirm where to find that handout, with the list of varieties that grow well there that you mentioned. That's Was that at the Payson at uh, Plant Fair? It should be at Plant Fair if it's not, um, I can, it'll, it'll be available at the, at the garden or if um, somebody wants to, if they want to contact me, Chris, with my email um, for the things that they can't find, I have most of the handouts and I can email it to them. Okay. Do you want your email in the box or not? Sure. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> Let me get it up. I'll put it in there. As a matter of fact, let me okay. uh, let me ask the next question while I'm doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, 
And Teresa asked, where can we find the, the recordings? I put that, that in the box. Uh, when would be a good time to set up a greenhouse, asks Marie. Any, any ideas on that? Uh, well, I set mine up. I've got a little one in um, my back backyard. Um, and I set it up in the early spring so I could use it for um, seedlings. But what I found is um, that my greenhouse gets too cold, even with a heater in it, um, up in pine for me to put seedlings in it, um, and gets too hot in the uh, summertime. So I have a um, real hard time using my greenhouse where I live. Um, it works great for putting my ferns and things to overwinter in, but I haven't had great luck um, setting it up. So if somebody else has a better answer. <laughs> well, this <laughs> may be a really good topic for me to cover at another time in the, in the extension series, in the webinar series. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we are open to ask some more questions here for the next uh, five or 10 minutes. So please go ahead and put those in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, and, and so we're, we're looking for some, a few more questions here. Uh, one thing that, that I'm thinking about is when you plant out in, um, in March and you're gonna start some of your major summer plants like your chilies or your um, tomatoes, you have an opportunity to grow something in the margins that perhaps will come to um, harvest sooner. So what are some plants that you would suggest to put out with the tomatoes that you would harvest say in May or June before the tomato plant gets large and into the monsoon season, that might be a good opportunity to take advantage of that space. Um, we do a lot of squash um, in that first part of the season. Um, we do a lot of um, beets and carrots and lettuce and celery and the colts cabbage. Um, cabbage does really, really well out there. The Brussels sprouts don't do so well. We had one lady that had the best um, production of Brussels sprouts last year. Usually we don't, we don't have a lot of that. Um, my onions and garlic and chives and, um, our, and shallots are all in the ground now that work really, really well. Snow peas, those kinds of things. So get your winter garden started. And mm -hmm. by the time those are starting, those are ready for harvest, then your summer garden can take over. Right. Okay. Good, 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 good direction. So Izzy's asking, what is the elevation in Payson? I don't know. You <laughs> so know, Chris, I don't know about, right off the top of my head. It's about 5,000 feet. So you get out of the desert. And so the thing with Payson is it's really hilly. And so if it's facing a little bit um, north, you can be in the Ponderosa Pines. It's facing south. You can have Chaparral. And so you got a lot of microclimates up there. So a bit cooler. Um, and, and just adjusting to those temperatures as far as aspect goes. Uh, Cheryl asks, did you say that morning glories are not allowed in Arizona or is that something like mint? Anyways, I guess she's trying to clear that. Mint that isn't recommended. Okay. It's my understanding that morning glories are illegal in Arizona. Um, that's what I've been told over the past couple of seasons. I don't know that um, other than that's what I've been told by other knowledgeable gardeners. And so we don't want those at all in um, the garden. 
I think that there are restrictions on morning glories. There are many species of morning glories. Not all of them are terribly invasive, like the field bindweed, which I think you were trying to think up of earlier. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. <laughs> which is already here and does just fine, you know. But uh, <laughs> and, and I think there are restrictions on selling morning glories from out of state into Arizona. Um, and then there's native morning glories, but what can you do? And mm -hmm. then mint can just be really invasive. One thing I've noticed about mint, if you can let your garden go fallow for one of our summers, and this may not be the case every summer, but if it doesn't get irrigated from April until the monsoons or the monsoons are bad, that's, that's a really hard experience on a mint. Um, Bermuda, just laugh at it. Just keep on coming back. But, yeah. But yeah, mint, mint yeah, if, you, if you've got a little water, it keeps on growing. Yeah, it's same with bindweed. It looks so pretty with its little purple blue flowers, but it is horrible once it gets started. And, and it'll stay, so. just, it's just like the uh, Bermuda grass. It just waits till there's water. Yeah, they're tough. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, what are your, Sadie asks, what are your thoughts of chickens in your garden? Um, I know a lot of people that allow their chickens to run free in their garden. Um, I know they use tricks like putting red rock in their gardens to peck on because once they get used to seeing the red and they peck on it and they don't get anything, then they don't peck on your tomatoes. Um, I've never had chickens in in my garden, I a lot of people put chickens in movable um, chicken coops so that they have the chicken manure in their gardens and that kind of thing. Um, I think the movable chicken coops a good idea because they won't necessarily bother a plant that's already grown, but they love looking for germinates, just little seedlings that they can pick out. And if they can find any bugs, they're going to eat those too. So, and then the manure, there's a lot of, a lot of pluses to having chickens and probably a few, <laughs> a few hazards too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, Cheryl's still asking about, do you know, Okay, about restrictions on other plants in the same family as morning glories like sweet potatoes. I don't think there's any issues with sweet potatoes being restricted in the state. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything like that, but it's just that there yeah. are many species of that morning glory, and particularly I feel bindweed is a very noxious plant. It gets has rhizomes that get in the ground and they just live forever. And yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Uh, I've got one more question that I'm going to shut it down here and we'll answer it then. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, let me get over to my slides here so we can finish up our program. Uh, thank you, Susan. We really enjoyed your presentation and we're going to get this online again here. Uh, please look in the webinar look for please complete the webinar evaluation i put the link in the chat box so please do that we just had our Q question and answer discussion with susan so thank you very much and um, just a little bit about next week um, we are doing the uh, spring gardening class series at the Payson community garden it is running from from february 11 through april 15. you can find the schedule here extension.arizona.edu gila and our next webinar on February 25th at 11, your speaker is me. So everybody's been watching. Going, I wonder if Chris knows anything. It's my chance to, get, <laughs> to be on the, hot, on, the, on the hot seat. And the topic is, again, we're still planning our gardens, but I'm gonna really get into ideas and concepts of intensive gardening. As Susan mentioned, the uh, garden is all about these six by 25 plots. And so how you can take the best advantage of those is what I'll be talking about. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign off as far as the recording goes and see you all next week.